at Sardis was on a uh, commercial route, so-called the Persian Royal Road. And the people of the city respected a whole bunch of, of Olympian gods and goddesses, and one of those goddesses was Artemis. We know that the cult of Zeus was respected here, as well as the cults of so many other Olympian deities. People were very much into different trades here, like gold trade, like dyed wool trade, and like agricultural products. And we understand that the capital city, Sardis, the capital city of the Lydian kingdom, turned into being an important commercial center of antiquity. The people of Sardis printed the first coins. The city was the hometown of coinage. And then sometime in the 4th century BC, the heroic uh, Macedonian general, Alexander the Great, came over on his way to India, to the Eastern world, to Persia, and made a huge donation for the construction of this massive temple here, a pagan temple which dates back to the time of Alexander the Great, and that's 4th century BC. That's Ashkin, our guide, as we traveled to the seven churches of Revelation last spring. And if you're new, we have been going through those um, seven churches in Revelation over these last several weeks. I want to invite you to take out your teaching notes because you'll find a good, clear guideline concerning the letter that was written um, recorded by John when he was on exile, but given by Jesus, the Son of God, and delivered then to this church. Tonight, we're looking at the Church of Sardis. One of the interesting things that we've learned over these recent weeks is that each of these churches has a reputation, but so do we. Westwood has a reputation in our community, but so do you, personally. You have a reputation in your sphere of influence, and our name is important, and our reputation really counts. Webster Dictionary defines reputation this way, an estimation favorably or unfavorably in which a person or thing is held. And most people want their reputation to be good. They want people to hold them in a favorable light. Because you had Time Change Sunday, I know you're really fully rested today, right? So you're with me all the way. I want to take a popcorn, kind of a fast approach to some personalities that you'll know, and you'll know their reputation. What's the first word that comes to mind when you think of these people? Adolf Hitler. Evil. Evil dark. World War II. How about Albert Einstein? genius creator, the, the uh, theory of relativity was his uh, contribution to us. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook guy, social networking guy, very rich guy. That's his reputation. Moses, we need more from Moses. In all of our services, we needed more from Moses. <laughs> the deliverer of God's people, Michelangelo, artist extraordinary, sculpturist, statue of David, still one of the most famous statues in the world in history. Mother Teresa, Servant, compassion, the poor, she touched their lives. And of course, Steve Jobs, what do you think of him? Yeah, Apple, innovator, hard personality. That was his reputation. Well, reputation is important. I have a, don't have a picture for an individual that I'd love to be able to have a picture for, but for Jesus Christ. Who, who is Jesus in your mind? What thing comes to your mind? Just hold that to yourself. You see, reputation is important. The word, N-A-M-E, name, is what is referenced throughout the Bible when speaking about God's reputation. So in Psalm 52, you find David um, includes these words, in your name I hope, for your name is good. And that word name appears from Genesis to Revelation, referring to the very reputation of God himself. And God derives his reputation from creation. He derives his reputation from his mighty works in our lives. From the word of God, scripture informs us of the reputation of God, but especially it's through his people that his reputation is made known. It's through you and me. It's how we live. It's how we use the name of God in Jesus Christ in our daily living that contributes to his reputation in our spheres of influence. This is an important question. Whose reputation are you trying to manage? I want you to think about that question. Because we have this inclination, it's very easy for us to put the emphasis on managing our reputation, of projecting an image of what we want people to think of us. 
But did you realize that when God breathed life into you, that one of the purposes he has for you is that you would increase his reputation, that you would make his name known, that you would make him look good. In fact, when you look at Westwood's purpose statement, it's clear, it's um, decisive, it's been with us from the very beginning, and it begins this way. We exist to honor God. That's how it starts. To honor God means to glorify God. To glorify God means to increase his reputation, to make God look good. That's the call that he has for us. So really think about the why behind the decisions you make in your life. Is it about making you look good or God look good? Now that question requires some introspection and some discipline, but I give it to you with the hope that you would begin thinking about it because it might change the very decisions that you make in your life. Well, the city of Sardis has a reputation. We heard a little bit about that in the bumper video. They were known for their wool. Coinage got started in Sardis. Isn't that interesting? So the coins we use got its birthplace in the city of Sardis. But also, we know that this city was devastated by an earthquake in AD 17. And it had a reputation of being rebuilt because the emperor at that time, Tiberius, decided to be generous because Sardis was so strategically located and so influential in that region, he wanted the city rebuilt. So he made a decision that that city and the citizens of the city would not be taxed at all for five years. Now, would that make you want to go live there? <laughs> Think about the money you would have. 30% of your current income, 40%, 50% goes to our government. Think of all that money in your hands. People flocked to Sardis, and it was rebuilt. It became an influential and very affluent city. Well, Jesus has a diagnosis of the church that was in Sardis, and it's a bit humbling, as you'll see here. You can follow along in your teaching notes. It's Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive but you are dead. Can you imagine being in that church service? Got a letter from Jesus. This is what he thinks about you. You're dead. I mean, that's not exactly an uplifting message on that day. It was a hard day, I'm sure, for those believers to receive this particular letter. I want you to notice the two things he says here. In essence, your reputation and your reality are not one and the same. In other words, you have this reputation of being alive. You appear to be flourishing. You appear to be active and successful as a church. But I, Jesus, see the real you and your private world is different than your public world because Jesus sees the inside. And he says, you're a dead church. That is, materially, you're alive. You have a lot of resources. But in the inside, your spirit is dead. That's just a horrible call. I mean, have you ever been to a dead church? Now, there's an uplifting experience for you. Go to a dead church. You just go and you leave and you go, man, that's a dead church. And it's not the most inspiring kind of place to be. But I hope you know that there are spiritually dead churches with people in them as well as spiritually dead churches without people. You take a trip over to Europe and go visit some of the cathedrals there and you've got to be inspired by those cathedrals. They're massive and they're glorious. And the architectural design of those structures is something to behold, but they're without people except for tourists. And I've been on many of those tourist trips and have been in many cathedrals and inside there's all kinds of people and they're going ooh ah but they're ooing and aahing not for God but for what architectural design I mean they tend to be non-active parishes with uh, a small remnant if any remnant at all and then there are churches with people that are dead that's Sardis people are coming people are active in the church and the outward appearance is that they're alive, but Jesus sees the inside and sees a dead heart. What does it mean to have a dead heart? From the perspective of heaven on high, it means um, that you're not spirit-filled. Or if you're spirit-filled, you're not living or abiding by the spirit of Christ who is in you, the hope of glory. See, it seems that they were taking credit for the things that they were doing. Rather than pointing people to God, they were concerned about their reputation, their image, and out of their own strength, they decided to do what they wanted to do and be what they wanted to be. But Jesus made it so clear in Matthew 5, 17, when he said, let your light shine before people that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You get the flow of that? That your capacity to make a difference in the world was given by God himself. So do the good works, do the good deeds in the name of Jesus Christ to the end that the Father in heaven receives praise. 
but they were doing the good works to receive praise from themselves. They were a bit triumphalistic, almost with an attitude that says, look at us. What a great church we are. We're the best church in the region. It was that attitude that seems to be apparent in the church of Sardis at this time. But it's the Father who gets the praise. And that's the, the fuel to spiritual vitality. See, Jesus isn't into the appearance of life. He's into real life, spiritual life. And so he has a prescription, fortunately. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't end his letter to Sardis saying, you're a dead church, goodbye. He doesn't end it there. I, I think that's really a good news part of this letter. But instead, he gives a prescription. He actually gives four remedies to this problem. Because remember, we're at the crossroads of change here. The last apostle living is John. He's close to 100 years of age. He's going to pass. So the church, for the very first time, is going to move into the future without one of the apostles giving primary leadership and instruction along the way. And Jesus does this visitation, this performance review, in essence, to be sure that they're on mission. And Sardis is not on mission. He wants them to get back onto mission. So he gives a hopeful word here in this prescription, beginning in verse 2 and following. He says, wake up. And strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. If you don't wake up, he's giving a warning there. If you don't want to be part of the mission that I intended for you, then I'm going to show up and, and there will be consequences. And part of those consequences, I think, is he shuts churches down. When churches get off mission, he goes, I, I don't want you to ruin my reputation. I'm looking for churches that are spiritually alive that would lift the name of God so that people will be compelled to want to know the name of God and to worship him and to love him and to serve him. And so he gives these four remedies. Let's take a look at each of them briefly. He says, first of all, wake up. You're sleeping. That is, your eyes are not open to what God wants you to be and what God wants you to do. Your ears are not hearing the prompting of the Spirit and what the Lord is tugging you to be and to, to do, but rather you're listening to people and you're looking at the voices of the culture to be the compass of your decision making. And you're at risk, he's saying. You're about to die. And he says, strengthen each other. And that word strengthen is actually a Greek word that means nurture. It means stand with and for Jesus the Christ, your Savior. It means stand with and for each other in the body of Christ because you need each other in this little remnant. And I hope you know this, that every spiritual awakening that's happened in the history of the church has happened through a handful of people who've gone before the Lord in prayer asking for revival and awakening in their churches. God loves to do great things through small groups of people. We see the masses and the harvest and think something must have happened on a, on a greater scale, but it usually happens with a remnant. And he's saying, from this remnant that's still alive, bring life, get back on mission. God will use you as you strengthen each other. Third, he says, remember what you have received and heard. Remember what? I think he's saying, remember Easter. In fact, I think he's emphasizing a, a call for them to remember the death of Jesus for your sin, the rising of Jesus for your life today and for eternity, the giving of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, so that once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, there's a spiritual transaction that happens, a supernatural reality that the Spirit comes and indwells you and mediates the very person of Jesus Christ so that you're coming and you're going, your being and your doing are being fueled by the presence of Jesus who is in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're experiencing the risenness of Jesus in the now. Remember means go on remembering, don't ever forget. So I had to take a step back from the preparation of this message and say, how does that get applied to my life, to Westwood Church? So I just started making a list. And of course, I can't go through everything, but I took some time just to stop and remember. I sure encourage you to do the same thing, to remember what God has done and is doing in your life because it will soften your heart. And I went all the way back into our first service at Westwood which was held in the small theater. There are four theaters in the Chanhassen Dinner Theater. We were in the small room. And two weeks before we went public on Easter of 1995, there were 90 folks who gathered to say yes to this church. And we met together for worship and just to be in that space to see what it would be like. And there are several things that just stood out as I took a step back to remember those moments. 
One was during that service, we all got up and we went behind every one of the seats in that theater and we put our hands on the seat and we prayed for the guests that would come, that they would be awakened to the reality that God is alive. And we concluded that service with communion. Our very first service in the Chanhassen Dinner Theater concluded with communion. And in that communion experience, a nine-year-old girl received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Our first service, we saw the fruit of what God was going to be doing in this community of faith. Within three or four months, we had outgrown that space. We really believed that we were going to be a regional church with a Chanhassen residence, a home base in Chanhassen. The problem was there were no other buildings in Chanhassen for us to meet in except for the Chanhassen Dinner Theater. And to make that transition from the little theater to the main theater was quite a leap. And if you've been to the Chanhassen Dinner Theater, you know what I'm speaking about. Because you have to walk through a bar to get into the main room. Not everybody wants to do that when they go to church. <laughs> and then once you got into the main room, it was dark. And it smelled a little bit from the party the night before. And there were tables and we couldn't move the tables, which means you had to walk in and you had to sit at a two top, a four top, or a six top. And you put yourself in the shoes of a guest coming into that place. See, you're all comfortable right now. You came in and you're sitting in rows. You're all looking forward, right? You're fairly comfortable. Walk into a space and you have to face each other. Maybe a complete stranger at a two top. Now there's an experience for you. And I remember our leadership board wrestling over this tension. There was no place to meet but that main theater. And we had concerns. We had fears. We thought, who would come and visit a church when you have to choose a two-top, four-top, or six-top? Would God grow a church when you had to sit around tables? And the answer was, oh, yes. Many people came to salvation while we were in that dinner theater. And we outgrew that space by 1997. And ended up going over to the high school, which was the next place that could accommodate the growth that was happening. And so when I stopped and remembered and treasured these 18 years of ministry, I see years of salvations and baptisms and marriages that have been saved and families that have been strengthened. And I could go on and on and on concerning what the Spirit of God is doing because this is the work of the Spirit. That's what he's calling us to do, to remember the work of the Spirit and what he wants to do in and through you. He says, remember then what you have received from on high and heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of the risen Christ is evidenced through the people of God, through faith in his Son. And then the fourth remedy he gives is to repent, which has shown up in each of the churches so far but one. And John Stott says the shortest road to repentance is remembrance. And I agree. Just even stepping back and thinking about um, God's presence in my own life, I'm mindful, as I've said to you many times, do you believe that God is working around you all the time? I sure do. From the time you're little boys and girls and teenagers and grown men and women, he is just coming around you, showing up all the time. And when you stop long enough to remember who he is, you see his grace in your life, his mercy in your life, his love in your life, all over the place. But if you don't stop and remember, you can easily forget the mercy of the Lord and that his compassions are new every day. And so this beautiful picture that repentance revives the soul to turn away from our sin and turn toward God, to stop what you're doing and remember the gospel and what's been done on your behalf. Your heart will get soft and it will be filled with gladness and your soul will be revived. Those are his four remedies and he ends with this beautiful promise in verse four. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Two promises are given by Jesus to the church of Sardis here for those who are faithful. You will be clothed in white garments. So already we know that most of those Christians in the church of Sardis at the time of receiving this letter claimed Christ but did not walk with Christ. They were in soiled garments, you could say. But here he's reminding us that there were some in their midst who did claim Christ and who did walk with Christ and that their garments were unsoiled. In fact, they are dressed in white. And white in Revelation is the color of worthiness and purity. Lest you make 
any mistake about it. Jesus wasn't looking to these people and saying, you're worthy and you're pure. He was looking at them and saying, you have claimed Christ and you walk with Christ. You have clothed yourself with the presence of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who is worthy. It is Jesus who is pure. You're just clothed in the righteousness of Jesus so the evidence of his worthiness and his purity is seen in the way that you live your life because you claim him and you walk with him. You know fellowship with the risen Christ. And then he goes on to say, your name will be in the book of life. That he himself, Jesus, the son of God, will confess to God the Father your personal name as well as to the angels. In fact, this little phrase is the same phrase you find in Romans chapter eight. It's the strongest affirmation that death can never separate us from Christ. And that is a confidence builder for us, that we are in the mighty right hand of God when we come to that place of salvation. To live in the vitality of that faith is the point that he's making. That Jesus Christ wants his church to be spiritually alive, not dead. Because dead churches don't get on board with mission very well. But he's looking to see the mission of love to all of the nations so that all of the nations would know the reputation of God's grace and love and mercy to be proclaimed through his people. That requires a vital faith, is what he's saying. Well, as I considered this text, I go, wow, what a, what a powerful word. You know, you're a dead church. I just can't even imagine what that was like to sit there. And because I'm a guy who likes to live in the, the positive side of the dimension of God's grace, I don't want to end with death. I want to end with life. And I ask myself the question, well, what does a spiritually alive church look like if we've been given an out here, here of the spiritually dead church? What's a spiritually alive church look like? And there are several texts that we could go to, but I thought a beautiful summation is found for us in Acts chapter two. On the backside of your teaching notes, you'll find it there. And the qualities of that community which increase the reputation of God, I think they're the picture, the role model of um, the, the believers that we ought to follow in our own journey. Pick it up at verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing their proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's a vital church. That's a healthy church. And there are 10 vital signs there. I'm just going to touch each of them so ever briefly, but I think they're important. And I want you to use it as an inventory. I did that for the church called Westwood, but also myself. Because even though the letter is written to the church, you know the church is comprised of people. So in essence, there were, the church was spiritually dead because it had spiritually dead people in it. So just ask yourself, am I practicing these things? And if not, um, what does the Lord say to me, what is he prompting me to be about? Let's just look at them briefly. A healthy church has devoted followers to the biblical teaching that was going on. In other words, after his resurrection, Jesus said to his disciples, teach them to obey everything I have commanded. And they did. The disciples taught everything that Jesus had commanded them to teach. And the disciples' lives were changed and transformed. I think about all the persecution they went through and they stayed faithful to him all the days of their life. Not one of them bailed, even in the midst of persecution, suffering, and death. And the Christians, these new followers of Christ, were taking in the word. Their lives were transformed. Their lives were transformed because of the power of God's word. The centrality and the authority of God's word is a vital sign to a healthy church. So I step back and ask, are we teaching the Bible to our children are we teaching the Bible to our students here in our student ministries? Are we teaching the Bible from this pulpit? Oh, I believe that we are. And if we're not in any of those given departments, I will send a memo because it's critical to life and vitality that we be in the word of God. And I say to you personally, are you in the word of God at home? In Bible studies, if you've never been in a Bible study, step in, it will ignite your faith. It will make you come alive. Be devoted followers of Christ to the scriptural teaching. Number two, meaningful worship. In fact, we see in verse 42, the word koinonia shows up. It puts the focus on the we, not the me. It's a bit hard for us in our Western view of things because we see everything from a consumer mindset, what I get out of it. But God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, lives in community, created us in community. 
We are the church. We are together. We are family. We're the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ is the metaphor the scripture speaks. There's one head to the body. It's Jesus the Christ. All of us are but parts in the body and we need each other. We work together. We're family. We're stronger together than we're alone. Are you in fellowship? If you come just to worship and you've not stepped into the fellowship and gotten to know other believers in the body, you miss out on some of the vital life force that God has for you. Number three, the breaking of bread in verse 42. They met and they enjoyed the Lord's Supper, which is communion. It's remembering Easter. It's never forgetting that Christ died for your sin and he rose again to give life today and for all eternity. Remember and never forget that. Some of you come out of faith traditions where you practice communion in every worship service that you attended. And others that come from a background where perhaps you practice the Lord's Supper just two times a year. At Westwood, we practice it the first weekend of each month. The Bible doesn't prescribe how often we are to come to the table, but we are encouraged to come frequently so that we would not forget and always remember. Are we doing that? Are we coming to the table? We're going to conclude our service tonight so you can all say yes to that one. And then the next one is steadfast prayer in verse 42. Prayer was a vital part of their journey. It's their first resource, not their last resort. You have to do more than pray, but you don't do anything until you pray concerning those decisions you have in life. Are we a church of prayer? Are we a people of prayer? I will tell you that the church was born out of a prayer movement because we invited 12 intercessors from Wooddale Church at that time, our home church, from which we were born, if they would pray for Westwood and its leaders and its people who would be coming every day for one year. None of them came to worship with us in community, but they all stayed at Wooddale, but they covenanted to pray. Many of them continued to pray for us faithfully and regularly. This church was born from prayer. It's been a place of prayer, and I encourage you to be a people of prayer. It leads to vitality. And then number five, supernatural awareness. It says in verse 43, look at it. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. They were overcome with how the spirit was showing up. It's what I was talking about a little earlier when I said I, I took a step back and thought about what God has done in this place. I mean, I've been undone, overwhelmed again and again and again by the magnificent power of God to change a life, to take a person who's a rebel and make them, you know, reputation increasers of God's grace, where people go, I didn't know that person could be this kind of person, but grace has changed who they are. Many of you have been touched. All of us have been at one point or another by God's grace to that end. And then in verse 44, the unified community, it says, and all who believe were together and had all things in common. It's the we again, not the me again. The togetherness isn't just a theory or a doctrine. It was a pulsating reality for them. And number seven, take a look at this. If this doesn't make you sit down and go, oh my goodness, verse 45. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. No kidding. It was a radical attitude to possessions that emerged as they came to faith. It was exciting. It was extravagant. It was seemingly impossible. The kind of generosity, the things that they gave up of themselves for the needs of others that were around them. And you go, how would that work? But God blessed their generosity. And it was a mark of a healthy, spiritually dynamic church. I'll just tell you this brief story of Mr. G. I want to tell you his real name, but I couldn't get a hold of him this week, and I don't tell stories without getting permission, so you're going to get the Mr. G. You get to know him as, I'm not even sure if he's alive, because when he gave testimony around his own life and his journey, he was an elderly man at that time. It was in 1984. I had actually started at Wooddale Church when that church was in Richfield, and uh, I was 23 years of age. In 1984, that church would move to Eden Prairie. And that's where Mr. G gave testimony to the story of Wooddale and how it was formed. I had not heard the story, and I think it's the first time that I heard out loud this kind of radical generosity in Acts 2 lived out today. As he told the story about he and his good friends that met for Bible study in a bar in Richfield. What is it with bars? I don't get this. Bars seem to be the place where light gets shown. I don't know. But they met. It was a convenient place. And they had a Bible study there. And they prayed there. And these men, over time, had an increasing burden to start a church in Richfield, believing that that community needed to be reached. And in order to do it, they decided to sacrifice of themselves personally to make it happen and they put second mortgages on their home. 
I had never heard of that kind of generosity before. That was completely radical to me that somebody would put a second mortgage on their home to build a church facility, but their burden was so great for that community, that's what they did. And if you go to 71st and Nicollet and Richfield, you'll see the first building, a small little white building on the corner. It's expanded into a massive facility over the years since then. And Wooddale continued to grow and to reach people. They outgrew that space and then they moved to Eden Prairie. That's where he told the story. Little did he know, Mr. G and his good friends, that from that Bible study in the bar, what God was going to do when Wooddale continued to grow and expand in ways that seemed impossible from where they were at the time in the 1950s when that church was born. And then in 1990, Wooddale decided they couldn't accommodate everybody in their facility. They started a church planting ministry. They'd given birth to nine churches. You have eight brothers or sisters, however you want to use that term. And they're all over Maple Grove. They're in Savage. They're in Egan. They're all over the Twin Cities. We were number three of those church plants. Nearly all of those church plants have had babies themselves. So Wooddale has grandbabies that have been born. The family tree is an incredible experience from a Bible study in a bar. This is what God does through extravagant giving. It's really something to behold. Oh, I encourage you to be generous. When I think of phase two, it will happen through the generosity of this people. That's how it will happen. And understanding that all that I am and all that I have comes from God. And that's the truth of the whole deal. And I know we're in a growth continuum, all of us. I don't know what people give specifically. I've chosen not to know that as a pastor, but I know the patterns of giving here because I have to manage an operation. I have to pay attention to it. About one third of the people who come to this church give generously and extravagantly. Another third are clearly learning how to give. They're trying to figure it out. Another third don't give anything at all. I don't understand that. All that you are and all that you have has come from God. And anything we have to give is because he's given to us first. Get in the game. It'll make all the difference in terms of the vitality of your own faith. Extravagant giving. And then genuine hospitality in verse 46. The power of hospitality is just an open heart and an open home. It made a difference as guests came through. Number nine, grateful praise. I love this. Verse 47, look at it. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Because joy is contagious, isn't it? So is crabbiness. Crabbiness is contagious. Some of you were crabby when you got in the parking lot to come into the space today. I know you were. I don't know your name, but Jesus does. <laughs> And crabbiness, you know, when you're a rith- ca- crabby person, you got about 20 seconds, and you go, okay, enough of the crabbiness. It's so contagious, and when we step into it, we become crabby. But joy is contagious as well. And here's the picture of a church that was filled with joy, and favor was shown to the people. And then number 10, I love this, verse 47, and the Lord, who did? The Lord added to their number day by day, those being saved. Are people being saved in our community? They certainly are. We welcome people. We invite them in the journey. We know there's a continuum of learning and figuring what this means to walk in Christ. You know, your body has new blood cells that make you feel healthy. And without those new blood cells being revitalized, you don't feel well. You feel sick. And the church is the same way. When the church no longer has new believers coming into the body, it doesn't take long for a church to become sick. And then probably for a church to receive the diagnosis that Sardis received, you're a dead church. It takes new blood, new converts to Jesus Christ to keep the church alive. Let's be faithful to the mission to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. So, whose reputation are you trying to manage? Yours or God's? Think about it as we come to the table. Would you stand and join me in prayer? Thanks, Father, for your goodness and grace that is given to us in so many ways. Thank you for coming into the messiness of our personal worlds. Thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for rising again, giving us the hope of life today and for eternity. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to mediate the very person of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, so that by his strength, we can be what you want us to be and do what you want us to do and that we can be alive and healthy and vital mission participants to make your name known in our own backyard and around the world. And I'm mindful, Lord, that there may be some right now in this room who would say of themselves, I am one of those dead people in spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you, as only you can do by the prompting of your spirit, would call them home. 
And if that be you this evening, just repent. Turn away from your life, away from God, and turn toward God and put your faith in Jesus Christ through the simple prayer of saying, Lord, I receive you. I want to know you and love you and worship you and serve you. And then come to the table, to the bread and to the cup that we would remember and never forget, God, your grace, your mercy, your life given to us. We're grateful, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.